Welcome back. In this segment, I want to talk about the idea of being Christ-centered. This is really, really important. I believe that all of the Old Testament foreshadows of Christ, and all of the New Testament looks back to Christ. Some people talk about being cross-centered or gospel-centered. There are all sorts of different ideas in, in preaching. In my opinion, the, the primary question I want to be asking is, how does this particular passage of Scripture help me better understand who Jesus is? What does this transcendent truth from this passage tell me about Jesus Christ, his life, his work, and his resurrection? I want to be Christ-centered. What I mean by that simply is this. Every time I'm going through a passage of Scripture, I want to highlight how this passage teaches me to better understand the person and work of Christ. In the previous segment, I, I used an example from 1 Timothy chapter 2, the idea when Paul says to Timothy that women will be saved through childbirth. And the idea that that doesn't mean that women will be saved by having babies, but it means that women, primarily in this case Eve as the example, have the opportunity to usher in redemption. Eve was able to be the one that would usher in redemption because she was the great, 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 great-grandmother of Jesus, and that she would usher redemption in that way. But in the same fashion, all of us have the ability to usher in redemption. But what does this passage teach us about the person and work of Jesus? This teaches us that Jesus is the one that brings redemption. So when I'm preaching through this passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2, I want to be mentioning, hey, this passage means this. Here's what Paul intended it to mean. Here's how the original audience would have understood it. Here's the transcendent lesson that we can take from their town and cross over to our town. And here's what this lesson teaches us about Jesus. This passage helps point us to the reality that only Jesus brings redemption. And this would be the point in the sermon where I would maybe take a quick side note and say, you know, in our culture, there's lots of people that think there are lots of ways to get to heaven. Maybe this would be a moment where I would give a, a quick quote or, or quote someone that's in pop culture talking about many ways getting to heaven. This would be a moment where I would say, this passage sheds light on the fact that only Jesus is the way. You see, Eve's value, her ability to redeem her own brokenness, was seen in the fact that she could usher Jesus in. That's where our value comes. We really have little to offer other people other than ushering Jesus into their lives. And the reason why we want to usher Jesus into their lives is because Jesus is the only one that can bring redemption. He is the only one that can make right that which has gone wrong. He is the only one that can fix that which is broken. Jesus is the great redeemer. He is the great healer. He is the great physician. See, when I'm, when I'm looking at 1 Timothy 2, I'm asking myself, what does this passage tell me about Jesus? And I want to take a quick sidestep to talk about Jesus. And for the rest of my sermon, I want that particular truth about Jesus, that particular character and nature of Jesus to now govern and inform the rest of my sermon. Everything else I say in the sermon from that point on should be influenced by the, by the person and work of Christ, and specifically whatever attribute I have highlighted. Now, sometimes people talk about being cross-centered, where they want to focus specifically not on the man Jesus, they want to focus on the cross itself. Basically, what did the cro cross accomplish? So if you're going to be cross-centered, you're going to ask yourself, what does this passage of Scripture teach me about the work of the cross or the work of atonement? If you're going to be gospel-centered, you're going to ask yourself, what does this particular passage of Scripture tell me about the gospel, the declaration, the, the good news that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, that we can be saved through faith in Christ? That's the gospel narrative or the, the gospel message. I want to ask myself, what does this passage teach me about the gospel? There's a variety of different ways you can be Christ-centered. Right? In, in some cases, you're going to ask yourself, what does this passage teach me about Jesus? Or how does this passage remind me of Jesus? Or sometimes you're going to be cross-centered. 
What does this passage teach me about the cross and the work on the cross? Sometimes you're going to be gospel-centered. How does this passage remind me of the gospel? Regardless of what angle you take or, or what method you want to embrace, it's irrelevant. Ultimately, you want to take the passage of Scripture and you want to relate it to Jesus. Charles Spurgeon was, was famous for this idea called the beeline. He would say, in every passage of Scripture, you want to make a beeline for the cross. He would say, that throughout England, there are many, many roads to London. But from every location in England, there is a path to London. In the same way, from every single verse in the Bible, there is a path to Jesus. Spurgeon made very clear that we as preachers must elect to take the path from every passage to Jesus in every single sermon that we preach. Let me give you some, some really quick examples that I think could be potentially helpful. In the Old Testament, I love looking at passages of Scripture and asking myself, how do these passages of Scripture remind me of Jesus? Let's say I'm preaching through the, the book of Genesis, and I get to the story of Joseph. Many of you watching this may be familiar with the life of Joseph. Joseph was a man who was betrayed by his brothers, wrongly thrown in prison, wrongly condemned. He was condemned alongside of two other prisoners. One prisoner would be restored. One would not be restored. And eventually, he would be elevated and exalted. Does this remind you of anyone? Jesus, betrayed by his brethren. Jesus, wrongly condemned, treated unjustly. Crucified between two prisoners. One who would be restored, one who would not. But then eventually, Jesus is being exalted to the rightful place where God had desired for him to be exalted to. Just like Joseph was exalted to the place where God wanted him to be exalted to. In fact, in Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says that God has brought me here so that many would be saved. You see, God was the one that orchestrated Joseph's life so that Joseph would be governor in Egypt so that many people could be rescued. In the same way, God the Father orchestrated the events of the life of Jesus and all the things around him, because God the Father wanted to elevate Jesus to the, to the rightful place where Jesus belonged. And God wanted many people to be saved through the life of Jesus. You see, if I'm preaching through the, through the life of Joseph, I am missing a huge component if I don't talk about Christ. I have to be Christ-centered. When I'm preaching through the, through the life of Joseph, I want to be asking myself, who is the author? Well, the author is Moses. What was Moses' intent? He was trying to teach some lessons. The, the Jewish people who are reading the life of Joseph, and they're reading Moses' words, how would they have understood this? How would they have taken the truth there and applied it to their lives? And how can I take that transcendent truth and apply it to my life? And I ask myself, what does this passage teach me about Jesus? It teaches me that God was at work in, in orchestrating the events of Jesus because God wanted many people to be saved. I want to relate Joseph to Jesus. Now, Joseph, of course, is an easier one. He's one of the greatest types of Christ we see in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's not nearly that obvious. But you're always going to be asking yourself this question. How does this particular passage of Scripture point to the work and person of Christ? Whether I focus on the cross and the atonement of Christ, or I focus on the gospel narrative, or I want to focus on one particular attribute of Jesus himself. Regardless of what particular thing I want to focus on, in general, I want to do the Spurgeon effect. I want, to, I want to do what Spurgeon would do. I want to make a beeline from my passage of Scripture to Jesus, the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. Let me give you another quick example that I love mentioning. All of us are very familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Young David, this, this Jewish boy, he goes out to the battlefield and takes on the big Philistine warrior, Goliath, and he kills him. Many people preach through this passage and they, they would say things like, oh, this passage teaches us that there's, there's great things in small packages or that you can do anything you put your mind to or you should be courageous to go to the front line. Those are the types of lessons that people typically pull out or extrapolate from that particular passage of Scripture. But if you go through a proper hermeneutical process, if you go through the process of interpreting the Bible in terms of what was the author's intent and, and what did the, the people understand, it's not the lesson you get. And if you try to be Christ-centered, that's definitely not the lesson that you pull away. You see, when I'm preaching through the, 
the life of David and I come to the story of David and Goliath, I'm going to ask myself, who's the author here? Well, it's Samuel. Why is Samuel recording this for us? Because Samuel wants us to understand that we need a savior, that we cannot go up against the, the Philistine army on our own. We cannot go up against the hostile world on our own. We need a savior to step in and that God sends us a savior to interject and to rescue us. You see, in the story, you're, you're not David. You and I, we're not David in the story. We're the scared Israelites over here afraid to go into battle, afraid to, to go up against Goliath. If you ask yourself this question, what does this story tell us about Jesus? It tells us that Jesus is our Savior. You see, in this story, David is a type of Christ. We are not David. We, we, not, we don't learn the lessons from the life of David in this way. What we learn from the story of David and Goliath is that we cannot save ourselves, so God sends a Savior for us. We're the scaredy cat, afraid Jews, afraid to, to fight Goliath. So God sends a Savior. In the same way, we are humans afraid to take on sin, incapable of saving ourselves. And God sends us a Savior. He sends Jesus to be the one to interject and fight on our behalf. And Jesus does this to bring glory to the Father. In 1 Samuel 17, David says to Goliath on the battlefield that day, today I'm going to kill you so that all the nations will know the God of Israel. 1 Samuel 17, verse 46. You see, the reason why God wanted David to kill Goliath on that battlefield that day, the reason why God gave him the ability to do it supernaturally was because God wanted David to shine the glory of God to all the nations of the world. In the same way, God sends Jesus to interject, to be our Savior, so that Jesus will shine and shout the glory of God to all the nations in the world. The reason why God saves you is not just for you. The reason why God saves you is so that you can shine his glory to all the nations, so that you can make Jesus famous where he currently is not famous. The lesson we learn from 1 Samuel 17 that the people of Israel would have understood when this was being written, approximately 1000 BC, they would have understood that God rescues us so that they can then make God famous to all the people of the world. And that's the lesson that transcends from their culture to our culture. The lesson is that God saves us so that we can make him famous where he currently is not famous. That's a much grander lesson that we should be preaching. When we get up on our, on our platforms and we get behind a pulpit and we say something like, the story of David and Goliath tells us that great things come in small packages. We are devaluing and discounting the grandest lesson of that particular passage of Scripture. Friends, I would encourage you, don't discount or lower the grand transcendent truths we find in the Scripture. Now, the New Testament is very clear, and it's much easier to do this with. It's much easier to be transcendent in the way we view the Scriptures, to sort of view it looking for the transcendent truths and to be Christ-centered. I've even had people say, I don't think we should read the Old Testament in that way manner. In fact, there are people out there that say we should not read the Old Testament in this Christ-centered manner. Why would you do that? And the reason why I believe we should be Christ-centered is because of John chapter 5. Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people, and he says, All of the law and the prophets testify of me. And Jesus is saying, every single word of the Old Testament is teaching you about me. Every single passage of Scripture in the Old Testament is testifying about the person and work of Jesus. It's a foreshadow of the New Testament. Everything in the Old Testament is setting up Christ, who he is, and what he intends to do on our behalf. Jesus himself in John 5 says, the purpose of the Old Testament is to reveal Christ. So why would we read the Old Testament and not look for the revelation of Christ? It seems like we are missing the Holy Spirit's grandest intention in giving us the Old Testament. The reason why the Holy Spirit inspired the writings of the Old Testament was so that we can better understand the man named Jesus Christ. His work, his attributes, and his atoning salvific efforts on our 
behalf. The book of Hebrews talks extensively about this, talking about the old covenant being obsolete. However, the old covenant being a shadow of the things to come. And that is the new covenant. See, everything in the New Testament looks back to the work and person of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament was looking ahead to the person and work of Christ. If you're going to be a great impact preacher that is Christ-centered, you must look for Jesus in every single verse. As you are highlighting and exposing every single passage, look for Christ. Ask yourself, how does this passage of Scripture teach me about Jesus? What does this passage of Scripture highlight about the attributes and character and nature of Christ? Expose that and preach that to your people. As Spurgeon said, there is a pathway from every city in England to London. In the same way, there is a pathway to Christ from every verse in the Bible. I'd encourage all of us, run to Jesus from every verse that we see in the scriptures. In the next segment, we're going to talk about commentaries and supplementary materials.